This Week at NASA. Thank you for a great handover, and I'm ready to assume command of the International Space Station. After handing over the reins of the International Space Station to NASA astronaut Kevin Ford, Expedition 33 Commander Sonny Williams of NASA, Soyuz Commander Yuri Malenchenko, and Flight Engineer Aki Hoshide of the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, all of whom have been on the station since July 17th, made a safe parachute-assisted landing in their Soyuz spacecraft in Kazakhstan on November 19th local time. Expedition 34 crew member Ford, Oleg Novitsky, and Evgeny Terelkin will be joined on board the station by Russian cosmonaut Roman Romanenko, NASA's Tom Marshburn, and Chris Hadfield of the Canadian Space Agency. Their arrival December 21st will restore to six the number of people aboard the orbiting laboratory. We hear you loud and clear aboard the International Space Station. Welcome aboard. The Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum's Moving Beyond Earth Gallery was among 25 North American locations at which participants of the Student Spaceflight Experiments Program, or SSEP, plugged into life on board the International Space Station during a live video conference with the ISS. The event gave U.S. and Canadian students an opportunity to ask station crew members about daily activities on board the orbiting laboratory. What advice can you give young kids like me about pursuing our dreams? Just have your eyes wide open and get ready for all those challenges because they'll be out there but they'll be fun and uh, the rewards are great if you try hard, work hard and do your best. A panel of space flight and science experts also fielded questions, including astronaut Leland Melvin, NASA's Associate Administrator for Education. The SCEP program is a joint venture between the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum, the National Center for Earth and Space Science Education, NASA, and the U.S. Department of Education. A new NASA service will help sky watchers pinpoint where and when the International Space Station will make an appearance in the skies above them. NASA's Spot the Station service sends a text or email to anyone with an email account or an SMS-enabled phone to alert them when the ISS is scheduled for a flyover in their area. Mission Control at the Johnson Space Center compiles sighting opportunities for 4,600 locations worldwide. To sign up, visit spotthestation.nasa.gov. If your city or town isn't listed, just pick one that's close by. Hi, I'm Ashwin Vasavada. I'm the Deputy Project Scientist for the Curiosity Rover, and this is your Curiosity Rover Update. A lot of what this mission is about is figuring out the possibility that ancient Mars was a habitable environment. But we're also studying the present environment. Two instruments that help with that are the RAD instrument and the REMS instrument. The RAD instrument is a radiation assessment detector. It measures the high energy radiation coming in from the cosmic rays and the sun. That radiation is changed as it goes through Mars' atmosphere to where we detect it on the surface. These measurements are helping to understand what the environment's like on the surface so that future astronauts will know how they can protect themselves from this harmful radiation. Another instrument that Curiosity has that measures the modern environment is called the Rover Environmental Monitoring Station. It's basically our weather station. We measure a lot of things including pressure and humidity, temperature and wind. It's been seeing little dips in pressure around noon uh, that seem like the signature of dust devils. Only thing is, our pictures haven't turned up any dust devils. Spirit and Opportunity saw lots of dust devils moving across the horizon. Our best guess at what's going on is that Curiosity is seeing dust devils go right over it. So what we think is happening is the same sorts of vortices uh, driven by convection are occurring on Mars at Curiosity site, but just not picking up dust. Another thing that RIMS has been measuring is winds. Turns out we're in a pretty interesting place inside of Gale Crater. We're right at the base of a five kilometer high mountain to the south of us, and then there's a pretty tall crater rim to the north of us. And we're sitting kind of in a flat depression between the two. Uh, the winds blow up and down the mountain as the temperature changes during the day and up and down the crater slopes, and then along the depression where we're at. Uh, so right now we're trying to figure out from the RIMS data exactly which parts of that wind field we're measuring. With Thanksgiving coming up, we've been preparing a few days worth of commands to send up to the rover to keep it busy while people here take some much needed time off. The rover will be acquiring a big panorama of our surroundings while we're away. I'm Ashwin Vasavada and this has been your Curiosity Rover Update.
NASA has announced the successful completion of the Kepler Space Telescope's baseline mission to search for planets in other solar systems. Since its launch in 2009, scientists using Kepler have identified more than 100 exoplanets and another 23,000 plus candidates. The tapestry of everything that goes on into Kepler, it's a really a team mission. It's an enormous number of people who come together to make this kind of a mission happen. In April of this year, NASA awarded the Kepler mission up to four more years of funding, allowing the telescope to continue its planetary census and to help scientists better understand solar system and planetary formation. Engineers at the Marshall Space Flight Center are using a new cost-saving method to create intricate metal parts for America's next heavy lift rocket. Called selective laser melting, the process uses a high energy laser to melt a fine metal powder into a computer-aided design pattern. A hybrid of 3D printing and artistic welding, SLM creates intricately designed parts with complex geometries that are more strong and safe in less time, saving millions in manufacturing costs. These new SLM created parts will be on the first SLS test flight in 2017. The Goddard Space Flight Center hosted a 2012 Veterans Day recognition program with former NASA astronaut and retired Navy Captain Scott Altman serving as featured speaker. Altman, who flew four space shuttle missions and commanded STS-125, the final Hubble servicing mission, praised those who defended and upheld those freedoms upon which our nation stands. All right. All right. now move it to the next. Hundreds of students celebrated the 20th annual Young Astronauts Day at the Glenn Research Center. They competed in a variety of activities testing their skills in science and engineering. Meeting with the students was Center Director Ray Lugo and NASA astronaut and Ohio native Greg Johnson, who serves as Associate Director of External Programs at Glenn. This year's event was sponsored by Glenn's Exploration Flight and Development Project Office and the Northern Ohio section of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Providing support was the center's Educational Programs Office. Thank you for joining us this evening. At the fifth annual Werner von Braun Memorial Symposium in Huntsville, Marshall Space Flight Center personnel and guests discussed a wide range of topics, including human space exploration, space commerce, national space security and policy, and trends in engineering education. The Von Braun Symposium, organized by the American Astronautical Society in conjunction with UA Huntsville, the National Space Club of Huntsville, and NASA, strives for the advancement of astronautics in the United States. Registration is now open for the 20th annual Great Moon Buggy Race, scheduled for next April 25th through 27th at the U.S. Space and Rocket Center in Huntsville. The Marshall-sponsored event provides high school, college, and university students from around the world with real-world engineering experience and inspiration to pursue careers in science, technology, engineering, and math. For details, go to moonbug.msfc.nasa.gov. I'm Jeannie Lynch and I'm Chief of the Flight Dynamics Division in the Mission Operations Directorate. The Flight Dynamics Division is responsible for the trajectory of the International Space Station. So that includes the visiting vehicles and how they fly to the ISS, as well as where the ISS is located, basically the altitude of how far it is from the Earth. My grandmother's grandmother was Cherokee. We moved to Florida next to my grandmother. My mother started getting more um, involved in the genealogy and our, uh, our culture. So when I was in high school and even in college before I moved away, I participated in a number of the local powwows and uh, other Native American functions. When I started for NASA, I was actually a new hire right out of college, uh, so I wasn't a co-op, but I did do my senior project when I was in uh, engineering school. That was a NASA-funded project through my university where we essentially built a little um, 
kind of lunar servicing station for a lunar lander. And it was amazing um, and, and a lot of fun. And any job you have, you need to give it your all. You need to take personal responsibility for the quality of your work, getting it done, and really being passionate about what you do. And I know if you do that, then it gets noticed and everyone appreciates it. And then your career will just continue to grow. Main engine start, six engines up and running, and liftoff. 14 years ago, on November 20th, 1998, Zarya, the first component of the new International Space Station, was launched atop a Russian proton rocket from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. During the initial assembly stage of the ISS, Zarya provided the station with propulsion, guidance, battery power, fuel storage, and rendezvous and docking capability for Soyuz and Progress space vehicles. Now that specialized components handle those chores for the station, Zarya is primarily used for storage. And lift off of Space Shuttle Atlantis, a mission to build, resupply, and to do research on the International Space Station. Three years ago, on November 16, 2009, Space Shuttle Atlantis rose skyward from the Kennedy Space Center on STS-129, an assembly flight to the International Space Station. Atlantis' crew consisted of Commander Charlie Hobaugh, Pilot Barry Wilmore, and Mission Specialist Bobby Satcher, Mike Foreman, Randy Bresnik, and Leland Melvin. Atlantis delivered parts to the space station, including a spare gyroscope and a UHF communications unit to be used for future station flights by SpaceX. The mission, the final space shuttle crew rotation flight to or from the space station, also returned to Earth NASA astronaut and station crew member Nicole Stott. And that's This Week at NASA. For more on these and other stories, or to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and other social media, log on to www.nasa.gov.